uh, welcome. This is my favorite slot right after lunch. Everyone is either still at lunch or completely comatose, which, which means not too many complaints, always, always a plus. And we'll have the late lunch eaters arrive. <laughs> Hi, b -Dale. good to see you. Um, so my name is Dirk Hondel. I have been doing open source for about 25 years, Linux for about 22. Uh, and for the past couple of years, I've been involved in something completely different, which is an end user application. I've never done that before. It's always been in the system. I've done X36, I've done lots of stuff. But actually an application that non-techies use was, was quite a departure. Um, the whole thing, of course, was not started by me. It was the guy here in the background that some of you might know uh, who starts weird projects. And I'm sure that after Linux took over the operating system market and Git took over the distributed version control system market, Subsurface will take over something. Um, I was here, well, in Canberra, but here, a year ago presenting on subsurface and, and kind of having a, a bit of a whiny session. And people were complaining to me afterwards that I was complaining a lot. And I was mostly complaining about GTK. And what a pain in the body part it was to, to deal with GTK. And, and so a, pretty much a year ago, this journey started that brought me to this presentation today. The idea to say, we move away from GTK and we switch over to QT. Now the obvious question is, why doesn't this scroll to the next slide? <laughs> that is really an obvious question. I'm using a Mac, maybe that's the problem. Hmm, okay. It worked. <gasps> this is the obvious question. Uh, the obvious question is, what do you think you're doing? And oh, by the way, the person swimming there, it's kind of hard to see. That's Linus. Um, uh, so this is, we love sharks. We, we, we are going to Christmas Island in, in a couple of days to hopefully swim with the largest sharks, sharks on Earth, whale sharks, about 30 meters. No, hopefully 30 meters long. Um, so we have tens of thousands of code. We have an active user base. We have a working UI that does most of the things that we want kind of mostly okay-ishly. Um, we had happy users. Why on earth would you throw this away and, and switch your toolkit? Um, and I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit about the why and the how and the what. And I'll, I'll hopefully be able to explain and show you what a difference the, the toolkit can make. But the challenge, of course, was we had learned the hard way how to do GTK. Neither Linus nor I are uh, uh, UI developers. Keith apparently agrees. Um, <laughs> and and the, the GTK code that we wrote apparently made, made GTK developers cry. But their code made, made us cry, so that was fine. Um, <laughs> But, but the challenge really was we had something that worked and we knew it would take us a very long time to get to parity. So for the first few months, for the first half year of 2013, we basically worked in parallel on two things. Released another version of Subsurface 3 based on GTK, get it to a point where we could have it sitting around for six, nine, 12 months, however long it would take us, and at the same time start developing uh, a, a QT version. So let's, let's talk about Subsurface 3.1 and, and why. Oh, on my screen, I don't see the whole slide. That's weird. OK. It shows up here. Good. Um, so this was GTK2 based. Um, it, it was an OK looking application. I'll show them next to each other in a moment. Um, we had the ability to do uh, Windows binaries, Mac binaries, and of course, in the Linux distribution from source. Um, there are some issues with the Windows support and, and Mac support in GTK. Um, the core developer community uh, quite clearly does not consider this relevant, important, or supported. So there are sub-communities that try to make this work with various degree of success. Um, 
the look and feel is absolutely not native. I mean, not even close to native. And you run into a lot of bugs and a lot of unexplicable and unexplained behavior. Um, we were at the point where people were saying, oh, this would be a great feature if somebody else would do the UI component. Because no one on the team was willing to deal with changes to the UI anymore. The complexity of doing this, the fragility, the fact that the, the model system was utterly broken in the way it's designed was very, very, very frustrating. And there were lots of things we wanted to do differently, lots of just user interaction changes that we wanted. And we could not find anybody who would help us implement it. And we couldn't figure it out. And the documentation is, what's the polite word for terrible? I think terrible, yeah. Um, but the biggest challenge for me, and, and, and I say this, uh, um, I've, I've said this to these people in person, and I'll say it here again. The biggest challenge for me with GTK is the attitude of the core community. The core community will tell you, if you have a problem, they will tell you, A, no, that I can't repeat. There's, I was just reminded of the politeness rules for this conference. The second thing they tell you is, you're doing it wrong. The third thing they're telling you, oh, you don't get our vision. And then they stop talking to you. Because obviously, that's all the help you need. Um, the, it is utterly impossible to go with a concrete question saying your documentation states this is what it should do. If I write exactly this code, it doesn't work. This is what it does. How do I get to working code? There is no way to get an answer to this. The only thing you can get is abuse. You can get long flame wars. So if you want lots of comments on your Google Plus posts, that works. Um, so, by the way, beautiful fish, poisonous. All, all these pictures are pictures that I took since uh, uh, my, my last presentation here. And this one actually was taken on Lord Howe Island. And this lionfish was, there were lots of them. They are, they're really beautiful. They're like this big. Um, so our, our issue with GTK was we tried for more than a year. We had engaged with a lot of, of GNOME and GTK developers. And we had come to the conclusion a year ago, this isn't worth it. Um, we're going to change. We're going to try QT. And when, we, when I talked about this in Canberra at this presentation, um, it was very interesting because I obviously got the required amount of flames from the GTK people. And I got a tremendous amount of enthusiasm from QT people. People walking up to me right there. I'm going to help you. I'm going to work with you. Now, of course, developers being developers, everyone wants to help the number of people who actually have the time to help, not, not so big. But um, the, the, the attitude in the QT community is fundamentally the opposite. So when you say something doesn't work, the answer is not unprintable and then you're doing it wrong. The answer is, oh, that's sad. Uh, can I help you? Explain to me what you're trying to do. Oh, have you tried this thing? Have you tried that? And oh, by the way, they have documentation. They have documentation for application authors. And if you tell them something, the documentation says this, and your software does this, they will fix it. So they either fix the documentation or the software. But the, the approach that this community has to, to someone who's trying to use their software is fundamentally different. And the other thing that was, was very encouraging to us is as I said, the volunteers that came out. Some disappeared, some did a dozen commits to help get us started, and then, you know, they're not diverse, they disappeared. We had one volunteer, uh, uh, Tomás, um, who doesn't dive. Well, he now actually got certified a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> but who has done about 80% of the, of the grunt work of porting this. In his spare time, uh, just because he loves working on, on, uh, on QT and he, he liked to encourage projects to use QT. Of course, as a side effect of all this engagement, he now has a job at Intel, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I keep telling people, um, if you're an active open source developer and you're unemployed, that's because you want to be unemployed. 
There are so many jobs for good people. We are desperately looking for good people. And so is everybody else in this industry. So yeah, being active, being a volunteer, helping pro projects is a great way to find a job. What I like about QT and what immediately was, was wonderful is it has very, very strong basic data structures. A lot of easy things are really easy. A lot of the, the, the basics of, of developing software. Linus and I are both C programmers. And, and we, I think Linus is on record how much he loves C++. <laughs> um, Google for it if you, if you don't get my drift. Um, but nonetheless, with QT, a lot of the ugliness of, of C++ is hidden from you. You can avoid a lot of the utter insanity. And there's lots of utter insanity in C++. And you can get a lot of things done very quickly, very easily. Um, I think if we hadn't had volunteers help us who truly understand how QT works, how a QT application is supposed to act, how you should separate your logic from your UI code, how the signal slots, the callbacks, all this works, it would have been very, very hard. And I think, to be honest with you, when, when I started on this a year ago, I underestimated the challenge. But with the tremendous help from the uh, QT community, it actually wasn't that bad. It, it took a while. It, I mean, this is a, a reasonably sized uh, UI project. So to get to feature parity took us about, I want to say, six months. We started using it for our own diving in the summer. So in August, September, I was able to do the things that I want to do with the QT version. And this is important. You need to use your own software, uh, which is what the evolution people really should do. Um, <laughs> You need to use your own software so you see the problems that people have, so you can, can start commiserate with your users. Um, let's see. Not everything is pretty when it comes to QT. Not everything is pretty when you migrate a project to, to uh, QT. C++, written and designed by monkeys on crack on a lot of crack. And um, is that offensive to say? Can I say crack? On, on illegal drugs. Let's say illegal drugs. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, pretty monkeys. Troubled monkeys. Troubled monkeys. Good looking troubled monkeys, apparently, but troubled. Yeah, yeah, from, from, from very bad homes and, and yeah, never mind. So, so C++ brings with it a few things besides just the insanity of the design and, and, and the utter nonsense that it brings in its, in its language spec. Compile times go up dramatically. So we were able, if, if, I, if I build the GDK version and the QT version, it's like a factor of five in how long it takes me to compile. For most developers, that's not a big deal because you know, the make system is reasonably uh, clever to only recompile what you need to recompile. But if you're the maintainer, so after every commit, you, you try to rebuild everything, you rebuild it on three platforms, it's pretty noticeable for me. Speaking of build systems, for, for the GTK version, we had a beautiful handcrafted make file that I believe not a single person in our team actually understood. And um, that did magical things. And then Tiago uh, made us switch to QMake, which is totally boring because you can actually figure out what it does. And it works on all platforms. And it, it, it's weird. Very disappointing. Oh, I forgot to, mention this, forget to mention this earlier. One of the big advantages that we had in our QT migration is Tiago Masiera. He's the QT core maintainer. And he's actually a coworker and a friend of mine. Also not a diver, um, but someone who, since he works with me, was, was nice enough to occasionally help us and most importantly point us to the right people. So often when we ran into problems, I was like, hey, Tiago, what do I do now? And either he knew how to fix it or he knew whom to ask, whom to get engaged. So local knowledge, having someone in the team who is connected with the community was, was a huge advantage. But, but back to the things that I dislike about QT. The model and view system in GTK is 
completely broken. The model and view system in Qt is pretty much completely broken. I don't think anybody has figured out a simple, easy to use system where you have your data structures and you can project them into a view that you can manipulate in a consistent way and that makes sense. Um, we, we, the biggest challenge on the QT side is the verbosity of all this. So the amount of boilerplate that you need to write, the amount of functions and functions and more functions that call each other, it's very easy to get lost in this code. And the challenge for me as the maintainer is I did not come in as a QT expert and people sent me all these patches, all this code, and I'm like, mm, I don't know. It's, it's been a learning experience. By now I actually think I understand most of our code and thankfully none of our QT contributors is here so they can't laugh. Only Keith makes big eyes at me when I say that. I, I think I, I understand the, the QT code well enough to, to evaluate patches that get sent to me and to, and to actually work effectively and efficiently as, as a maintainer. But um, the model view system certainly is, is one of our biggest challenges. There are other challenges that, that come from the way C++ works. You can't have simple static helper functions. You, everything is hidden behind classes and, and this makes everything complicated. But once you go over this first initial hurdle, it actually becomes pretty nice. I have been an Emacs type developer since forever. My first open source project that I contributed to in 88 was Emacs or X Emacs back then. Um, so I, I have always done all my development within Emacs, Emacs being my IDE, it just works, it's beautiful. I can't believe I'm even admitting this, but I've switched to Qt Creator. It's an incredibly powerful uh, IDE that really makes things very, very easy. And it's a huge improvement to my workflow, to being able to, to um, trace and track what people have done, how the data structures work together, how all this, uh, with an integrated help system, how all this is supposed to work. It's very, very nice. Um, the other thing that has helped tremendously is that once you have your minimum system working, extending things, making changes, making modifications, has become so much easier because the QT system is fairly well, well encapsulated. So if you make a change here, you normally don't risk breaking everything, which has been our experience in, in the GTK world. So after talking for 15 minutes about all the reasons why we did this and the things that we, we loved and hated, this is um, uh, uh, obviously subsurface 3.1. Um, the last version, this is actually a screenshot from a Mac. I'm running all this on a Mac and you'll see in a second why. Um, this is a screenshot from a Mac. This is uh, subsurface 4. And you know if you switch back and forth, yeah, this looks like a Motif application, this looks like a Mac application, it's kind of nice. Um, but I actually do something that is completely crazy. Oh, by the way, who can see the fish? It's a crocodile fish from Palau. If you see, here you see its mouth, above here the two eyes, and then you can see it. Anyway, love these guys. Um, so I am going to tempt the uh, goddess of demos, and I'm going to do something I haven't tried before, which is running demos on three different OSs at the same time. And this is why I'm here on a Mac. So let's start. This is, hopefully, this is the wrong one, of course. <laughs> this is subsurface on a, on a Mac. And why is this window not big? Ah, yeah, demos, I love demos. So this is the old version of subsurface, GTK-based. You, as a, as a Mac user, you, you recognize your, your widgets. Actually, no, you don't. We have a beautiful system to create maps in a separate window. Map sources, but actually are the same as on the QT version that you'll see in a moment. Just the widget is unbelievably ugly. Um, if you want to edit something, so you click here and you edit. And, oh, oh, nothing happens. Too bad. Because you can't edit things here. If you want to edit something, you double click and you get a new window. Ooh, isn't that beautiful? More back to motif. Editing right here 
And then you, you go back to your actual application after you edit. Look at the beautiful tag system that we wrote. Oh, by the way, and I need to say this for the GTK people. Are there any GTK developers besides, well, you're not a developer, Karen. Uh, okay, one GTK developer, good. Um, two, two GTK developers, I should have asked before I started. Um, <laughs> Of course, the fact that our application is but ugly is our own damn fault. I'm not saying that you can't do pretty applications in GTK. I just don't know how. Um, so let's switch to um, the Qt version of this. This looks actually like a Mac application. It uses all of the native widgets. So if you, if you do something like a file open, you get something that looks like a Mac file open dialog. If I go back to this one, and do a file open. Yeah, that doesn't look like a Mac dialog, I'm sorry. Um, but if you want to edit your dive, you say, oh, let's edit something, and you are in your editing mode, and you can edit the dive. Um, we have a very nice feature. If you don't have a dive computer with you and you want to add a new dive, let's show this in the GTK version. So let's say we want to add a dive uh, like this. Awesome, you can pick a date a time, a duration, a maximum average depth, you're done. Or you can do the same thing under Qt. Oh, you have a profile that you can you know, graphically edit, can, can change your dive around, have a longer safety stop because you know, you're on Asunto. Um, you have a, a much more natural look and feel to everything that you do. It is much more user friendly to, to deal with this. Um, there are some challenges, obviously. You see some weird artifacts sometimes. But we're fairly early in this development. So on the Mac, oh, the one thing that I want to show that I absolutely love about the widget that we use here, if you change your dive the way, oh, network is slow. So now we are in Palau, and you can see where I was on the Earth as I, as I switched between the two dives. And this here is last year on Lord Howe Island for the Australians. Beautiful, except that the weather sucked which is why this year we're not going back to Lord Howe. When we arrived in Sydney uh, on whatever day of the week that was, and the first message we heard arriving in the airport was that the flight to Lord Howe was canceled. Okay, so and now comes the interesting part why I'm on a Mac. Move one direction and, uh, yeah, okay, let's re-log in. Uh, hmm? Yeah, 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 could you hear my... So now we have a, a Windows application um, looking at us here. Again, uh, this is clearly the, the GTK version. Very much the same motify look, uh, the same issues with, with integration into the, the native operating system. A, a... Oh, that's awesome. I can't get to my controls at the bottom. Screen resolution. And then we can switch to the Qt version, which looks much more like a modern Windows application. And, and here's the interesting thing. So the two applications, if you compare the two GTK applications, they look very similar. They look similarly bad. The, the Qt applications actually look much more like a native application. This is the way I expect a Windows application to look. It has very much the typical look and feel that you expect. And the, the integration into the native widget set is significantly better with, with Qt. And it's very easy to do this. So the, the, the only place where theming is hard, the only place where you run into issues with Qt is ironically under Linux. Because in the Linux world, there are so many different uh, um, styles for the desktop environment that the people already use that depending on whether you're running this under KDE or under GNOME or under XFCE or under i3 or whatever you want to choose, the integration into the individual uh, um, uh, widget sets is not always equally good. So let's switch to Linux, yay. Um, again, this is, I'm now running under KDE. This is the GTK application looks at it actually pretty good. I, I like the, 
the, the widget said that GTK uses under Linux. And under Linux, we had the fewest problems with all this. It wasn't the look and feel, it was the functionality, the inability to edit things in place, the inability to do a lot of the things we wanted to do with the user interface, where we couldn't figure out how to do this. But if you switch to the Qt version, I still think it's more attractive. I, I certainly like the way we can uh, present information in, in a more interesting way. We have, oh, this is too narrow. This is, I, I usually run this in uh, 2560 by 1600. And now scaling my, my settings down to uh, uh, this tiny screen size of 1024 clearly has some issues. But for example, you have, you have a widget where you can simply just you know, set stars as you would expect, you click on them. If you try to do this under GTK, uh, wait, no, I can't do this here. How do I do this on GTK? Double click here and then you, oh, then you have a drop down. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, exactly. I think that just showed you the difference between the, the two look and feels. Um, I don't want to bore you with too many demonstrations of, of what worked in different and didn't work. I want to much more talk about what are the challenges for a pr project that decides they want to do this. Uh, go back to my presentation. Yeah, yeah, survived the demo. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was the hardest part. The, the, making it work on, on the small screen and making it work on three OSs at the same time. By the way, um, if you do a multi-platform project, you have to have the ability, wherever you are, to build it on, under all three OSs. So I actually am, am running on a Mac specifically for that purpose. Because I, I, if I want to do, develop for Mac, just occasionally cross-compile it does not work. We cross-compile all of our Windows binaries. So all the Windows binaries are created in the Linux and then just tested in the VM. Um, but on the Mac side, that is a real pain and uh, it's really hard. I have set up a cross-compile environment where I can compile from Linux for Mac and that created so many instabilities and so many issues that I gave up on it. So I now run natively Mac OS on this laptop and then have Linux and uh, Windows in VMs and simply switch between them. I do. 90% of my work under Linux. I run Linux full screen and consider the Maverick simply a hardware abstraction layer, which kind of works. Um, so the, the challenge with, with the migration is, is fairly easy, easily summarized. Your existing code base, usually, especially if you're not experienced uh, end user application developers like we certainly were not, has a, a fairly tight integration and, and co-mingling of what is UI code and what is the logic, what, what, what is the core logic of your application. And especially for something like Subsurface where we do the, actually I need to go back and, and illustrate this hopefully. So if you look at, at, the, at the profile plot on the upper right, where you see how we try to visualize what happens during the dive, um, let's, go to an easy, yeah, something like this here. Um, you can see there is the, the time where we are hooked off on, an, on a reef, so we are basically not moving. So you have a dark green line that shows no change in, in depth. And then as I'm moving around, you see the color changes depending on how quickly I move. So I use color to convey information. Same goes for the diagonal line, which is the t tank pressure you see the parts where I move hard, where I work, where the color gets red, which means I use relatively more air. And then when it gets green and darker green, where I use less air. All the, the, the math behind that, the data analysis, is your program logic. How you display it changes between GTK and, and QT, obviously. So one of the big challenges for us was to really pry this apart. So the first couple of months, literally, of this porting project, was me sitting on the GTK version, separating visualization, <laughs> UI components, from the core logic that do the math, that do the background. Splitting it into two files because the person working most in the QT stuff didn't really understand the diving side of all this, certainly didn't understand the math, didn't understand the ideas behind it, but I needed to give him the functionality to get the data that then could be displayed on the screen. 
So the, the biggest first step really was figure out how you can, as much as possibly, separate your UI code from your core logic. And of course, uh, smart people will tell me we should have done that from the beginning. Uh, yeah, okay. It is hard. Thank you, Keith. Someone who commiserates with me. It's, it's hard, and, and I repeat, uh, most if, if you go through the open source projects that are out there, that are end user applications, and you look at their code, once, once you washed your eyes out again, you will realize that most people don't start out as brilliant developers. And even if they are brilliant developers, they usually write kernel code. And, and strangely enough, you, user, end user applications are different from the kernel. So whenever I have Linus tell me, oh, but that's inefficient. I'm like, yeah, but it's not the kernel. It's an interaction with the end user. It doesn't matter if it takes 200 cycles longer. Anyway, so the, <laughs> you have no idea. Um, <laughs> have, having a brilliant developer on your team is awesome. Having a brilliant developer on your team who A, started the project, and B, is opinionated like, like Linus, uh, can be challenging. Um, anyway, so. Once you've gone through this whole process of trying to separate out, this is how I display things, this is how I, how I do the math, how I do the logic, how it's supposed to work. The second big challenge is that in the, the re-implementation, you separate out from here are the things where we didn't get what we wanted because we couldn't get it to work, from, oh, this works as intended, don't change it. So I, I keep showing this, this oddity that we can't edit in place. And I know this is possible in GTK. We just weren't able to make it work. So you have to do the double click and you get the weird window. Um, of course, you don't want to re-implement something like this in Qt. On the other hand, we absolutely love the way our profile looked. And we want to make sure that under Qt, this looks very much the same way. So you need to separate out on, on your UI code what is the functionality that I actually want or that I want to make tiny improvements to? For example, if you look at the, the overlay display. So here you can just move the overlay around and it stays where it is, stays put, and it shows you the additional information for wherever your mouse cursor is. Versus in GTK, this is a tooltip and it does random things. And I can never explain when it shows up and where it shows up and why it sometimes moves and sometimes doesn't. See, now it jumped. It's weird. Um, so where do you want to make just small adjustments versus where do you want to use the strength of the new toolkit and uh, um, implement things totally differently? So what I found worked extremely well for us was to have someone who is very familiar with the new toolkit, with, with Qt, but isn't familiar with our application and not even with the use case. So someone who challenged me every step of the way, making me explain a, what is it that I want? Why do I want it this way and not another way? And constantly came with new ideas. Oh, we could do this. Oh, we could do that. Now, UI developers are interesting people and they have crazy ideas. So, uh, there is often the reigning things in, yeah, no, we, we, we don't need to have this completely different. Staying true to your vision, staying true to what you want your application to be. But at the same time, listening to all the great ideas of how things could be different. So if you see the, for example, the amount of information that we are showing in the dive nodes between the two applications has increased dramatically. So we're showing a lot more things in this one window because of the push from our UI developers to have less overlays, secondary windows, additional things, and make things simpler more in, in one place. Fewer pop-ups, fewer additional dialogues. It's things like this. So it's very important to listen to the people with the experience and to find this balance of what do I want and what can I get done in, an, in a finite amount of time. So we had foolishly hoped 
to get, or I shouldn't say we, I should blame myself, I had foolishly hoped that from starting the work on QT in earnest in about early April, you know, within about six months, yeah, come on, in six months you can get this done, right? So I was hoping that by early fall I would be able to release Subsurface 4. And it actually took a tremendous effort by a few people uh, through the month of December and many, many, many sleepless nights to get this done. Fortunately, I suffer from pretty bad insomnia um, with the result that very often between midnight and 4 a.m. I would be downstairs sitting on the computer working on subsurface instead of doing foolish things like sleeping. Um, so, We have, of course, more ideas what we want to do and things that we think are additional benefits that we can get from the migration to Qt. One of the fun things with Qt is what they've done with QML, that you can create a, a scripted, descriptive way of doing your UI and that allows you to trivially port your user interface to touch-based devices um, Qt and QML are supported under iOS, under Android, under Tizen, uh, I think under BlackBerry, but who cares. Um, so the ability to move this to a tablet. Now, there are, of course, challenges. Um, phones and tablets tend to not have full USB stacks. Uh, a lot of the supporting libraries that we need for this to work aren't necessarily ported yet. So the biggest for us is LibDive computer. I assume, I should have asked in the beginning, do you guys even know what Subsurface does? Uh, yeah, I, should, I guess I started in the middle. So what we, what we do is we, you can download dive data from a dive computer and visualize it. But this download from a dive computer, this is of course a highly proprietary industry where everyone invents their own download standards and uh, it's extremely fragmented. So there is a library that is used by many different DiveLog programs, many commercial proprietary DiveLog programs called LibDive Computer that is at the core of what we do. So even if we move subsurface to a, a tablet or a phone, you still need to be able to have that library compile and work there and have the ability to connect your device. So you need host mode USB instead of just gadget mode uh, uh, USB. Um, other things that people want integration of, I mean, obviously I like the pictures that I do, integration of pictures and video into the program, a lot more ability to mix statistics, mix information that you can gleam, data analysis that you can gleam from your past into the future, more support for technical divers, for crazy people who die, uh, to die diving rebreathers, no, who dive rebreathers, sorry. and. Um, things like that. But right now we are super thrilled. We have a version out. I, I got it out, I think, two weeks ago, right before Christmas. Uh, and I'm hopefully tonight releasing 402 because I, in my excitement, in, included a very nice bug in the last one that on Windows causes frequent cra crashes. Um, but yeah, the, we, have, we have tons of ideas and as always more ideas than we have times and have developers working on this. And with that, questions? I have a comment. Oh, gosh. Oh. I just found the presentation about the GTA version not being able to edit the text box. It's not that you can't edit the text box. You can. It's easy to make the text box editable with GTA. That is another problem. It's that when you make it editable, getting the focus to work right with all the other things that you're in, in the same window, we can never work out. So our solution to the fact that we couldn't make, get the both of the edit that we wanted was to have this separate editing window. It was not because we can't get the text box. So if somebody wondered why that happened. That so I'm supposed to re repeat what, what you said, Linus. Uh, the, the quick summary is, yeah, I know. The quick summary is, as I said earlier, in many cases, the things that we wanted to do may have been possible with GTK. We just couldn't figure out to make them work the way we wanted them to work. Linus gave the example of editing a text box. Yes, you can do that, but then your focus in the rest of the application doesn't work and getting in and out is a real pain. Um, but fundamentally, the, I, I am convinced 
that most everything that we've done in the Qt version would have been possible in GTK. It's just if you are a group of, of, of hobbyists doing this for fun and you can't get any help in getting the development to do or the program to do what you want it to do, at some point it's, it's time to move on. Other questions? Yes. Yes. And how having someone very familiar with the UI can be extremely helpful. And you guys at Intel have some of the best GTK developers. So would you say if you had to do the same with GTK3, you would have got a much better experience in it? So the question is, um, my, my presentation was about how rewriting a UI can make it better and whether with the right people, um, if we could have done this in GTK3. My honest answer is no, I don't think so. Um, so, obviously, this is me as a private person. So, this is not an Intel project. I can't just go to a, a coworker and say, I need you to work on this. And all attempts to get the many GNOME people at Intel to look at this and, and participate have utterly failed. We got a random patch here or there, but we were not able to get anyone involved. And when I asked why, they say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't write applications, I write GNOME. I don't care. I don't know how to do this. We had three of the core GNOME maintainers sit together and try and help me answer one of my questions. And they said, I have no idea how to do this. I never do this. So the fundamental issue is not that I think it's not possible to do this in GTK. It's that no one knows how to do it. It's not documented. And there is no easy way to get this help. That was the challenge why we moved away. But this is not an Intel policy question. This is not an endorsement or anything. This is an open source project that I happen to maintain in my spare time, usually at night. And, and this is our experience. Karen. Okay. If, if you saw less well-known people enter the community and have similar involvement. So the question is if we got great help in the QT community because Linus is famous. Um, <laughs> well, so, A, Linus was famous when he worked on GTK, and that didn't help us. Um, <laughs> but to answer your actual question, um, yes, so I've talked to a bunch of other projects who have recently migrated from GTK to QT or who have started to work on QT. And in general, the, the response from most of the application developers is that the commu QT community is very, very open to questions. And, and I think, and, and okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm assigning intent, and please correct me if I'm wrong. But my perception is that the, the GNOME and GTK developers see development of GNOME as their goal and GTK as the toolkit to do that, and that is their focus. And there seems to be very little focus on, on other people trying to develop applications. On the other side, QT came from the Trolltech days. So this was a company that made their living in consulting two ISVs who then wrote applications. So their whole focus has been great documentation for people who want to use their toolkit, uh, a, a, a good way of interacting with them, of getting the information out to them. And oh, by the way, KDE, well, the counterpart to GNOME in this comparison, right? KDE was completely disjoined from this. KDE was just another set of applications that happened to use Qt. And, uh, I, I see a lot less overlap in the developers between the KDE people and the QT people, and a lot more interest in people who are just writing an average app. And oh, by the way, in, in the GTK world, the whole idea that you might not actually be running this on Debian as the main platform, but you might be, oh my gosh, on Windows. Um, there is a lot of hostility towards any problems that you report that happen because you're trying to do this on Mac or on, on Windows. Yet, if you write a program for a diver, while we have, I mean, who, who in this room is a diver? Yeah, we have a, 
a few open source divers, but, but the vast majority of our users are on Windows and Mac. And actually the fact that we have Linus as a developer distorts this. So we have about um, uh, 65% Windows, 20% Mac, and 15% Linux. And if Linus wasn't one of the developers, we'd have 2% Linux. I guarantee you that. And so in the Qt community, working on Mac, working on Windows is a core goal. If it doesn't work there, it is broken. But you do not have that on the GTK side at all. I think that's all the time we have. Um, Did I miss your signal? I'm sorry, I was. Okay. Um, I was impressed when you were swimming with sharks and jellyfish, and then you did a triple live demo. So <laughs> I think you've definitely earned this gift. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.